I'm John Grenham, and this is the latest video in my series um, about Irish research and how it relates to my website, johngrenham.com, Irish Ancestors. And this video is going to be about the recent revolution, fairly recent revolution in Irish online research. Um, it's something that has completely changed what's possible in Irish research. And it's something also that has made the site possible and also that the site exploits. So I'm going to, going to, to talk a little bit about how it came about and then what its effects are, how, how you can use it, how the, the, the records fit together because of it and so on. Okay, so let me, I'm going to do that first of all by talking about what came before the revolution. In other words, what was there that changed so radically? What was there was a giant hole in the collection of Irish records. Um, the most important fact about Irish research uh, still, and for the last 100 years, has been what happened to the Public Record Office of Ireland in 1922. Um, Ireland had been measured and counted all through the 19th century very, very thoroughly by basically by the administration in London um, because they had knew very little about it before then, so they had to find out fast. So over the course of the 19th century, it was probably better documented than anywhere else um, in what was then the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. So we had loads, of, we had the earliest censuses, we had the earliest um, systematic mapping, we had the, the most, the, the world's greatest cadastral land survey. We had all sorts of things. Um, and it, from 1867, we had a world beating public record office to collect all these records and keep them safe. And then in 1922, as the opening um, battle in the civil war between the, the, the two Republican sides who disagreed about um, how the, the country was to be governed, um, the public record office was completely destroyed and 98% of the records it contained were burnt. And it's worth um, being a bit, uh, uh, dwelling a bit on, on the sheer scale of the loss because the 19th century census returns, um, the Church of Ireland parish registers, the collection of wills, the land documentation from the 17th century onwards, um, extraordinary military records, gone, completely gone, okay? So what we're looking at on the screen here is a, a blog post that goes into excruciating detail. Uh, this is a blog post on the site, excruciating detail about what exactly happened over the three days of that battle in 1922. Um, it's worth taking a look at, this is the, the, the picture that breaks my heart. This is the interior of the record treasury in the public record office. Um, sometime um, in the 1910s. And you can see it was an extraordinary creation um, designed to allow natural daylight to come all the way down through five, six floors of record bays. You can see that the, the archivists and the, um, the, the record carriers all um, busy. This is the building that was destroyed in 1922. And it was crammed to the gills with um, historical documentation with treasures we'll never see again. Okay, one of the things I try to do is look at the bright side of things. Um, there is not much of a bright side here, except for the fact that this did simplify Irish research. We were left with so little that it was actually very easy to master the few records that survived. And it was for somebody coming into genealogy in the 1980s, it, you know, it, it was very easy to get, to, to get a grasp of the entire field because there were about four and a half records there. And um, once, you, once you knew how they worked, um, you were pretty much in the driving seat. Um, and that's one of the reasons that um, Irish research had this terrible reputation as being impossible. Um, from about the 1990s, mid 1990s on, um, the, the Irish state, and the, the Northern Irish state began to wake up to the fact that there was a, a diaspora out there that had a, a connection with Ireland that deserved to be respected. And one way to respect it was to make maximize access to those few records that survived. So what records 
the records that survived, the four big ones were the censuses of 1901 and 1911, which weren't in, hadn't made it to the public record office of 1922. There are the, the non-Church of Ireland parish registers, um, church records, so Presbyterian, Catholic, Baptist, and so on. Um, there were the, the, the property surveys, Griffiths in particular, um, which was in the valuation office, not in the public record office. And then there were the state records of births, marriages and deaths, which were um, in, in a different building altogether, part of a different system from 1864, 1845 for non-Catholic marriages. So those were the big four. And um, slowly, um, the state moves slowly, but thoroughly when it does move slowly, all four of those big ones became available online. Um, the first was the, the census. Okay, well, and I'm going to, to take you through how my site relates to those. So let's just take um, the surname Moore. Okay, and you have the, the, the mid 19th century. First of all, um, the, uh, the Griffiths, that, that is the Griffiths map that you're looking at there, the Moore households, that's based on the index of surnames. Well, that's one of the bases of it, the index of surnames produced by the National Library of Ireland. So that's, again, public service. Um, the 1901 census, that's based on the, uh, the website, the National Archives website, um, census.nationalarchives.ie, which is freely available, freely available to link to. And um, it... It would not be possible if it hadn't been public sector and freely available um, for me to do this. So that's that's um, the, the the way that works. Um, if we go back and look at say um, Moors in Donegal, okay, and we pick a parish, say Kilmacrenan, Kilmacrenan in Donegal, um, we want to see the 1901 returns for Ahawoni. You can click on the 1901 link and there you see it's Ahawoni there and there are all the, the people there. So again, that's because this is public service because they're made freely available. And that the 1901 and 1911 being available like that actually lit a, a, lit a bonfire um, in Ireland under genealogy. Um, people suddenly could see their ancestors' signatures um, on these, these census returns could answer long-standing family questions and could um, could peer into the, the their neighbors' ancestors' houses as well as their own. So that, that was um, an awful lot of fun. A lot of people got addicted and a lot of genealogy came from that. Um, and because they were so successful as well in the South, particularly the, the po politicians began to look around for other things that might be useful. Um, and the, the biggest and most um, useful one were the births. Okay, births, marriages, and deaths on the website Irish Genealogy, which is run by the uh, the Department of Arts, Heritage, Culture, and the Gaeltacht They're not in the south. Um, they simply made all of the records freely available, indexed, linked, and images, and again. This site takes advantage of that to present a visual version. So, so how many moors? There are 172 more births in Athlone. You click on the link and you go to Irish genealogy. You jump through a hoop or two. And there you are, all the moors in Athlone. So say so Jane Moore, 1912. Okay, you can see a transcript where there isn't an image. In most cases, there will be an image. Peter Moore in 1896, and you get the full original. There's Peter, Father John Moore, Mother Bridget Moore, Nay Benson, formerly Benson, a labourer. Okay, um, so you can see that it's possible to do that because it's freely available. It's an open, um, an open, um, open and accessible. And one of the reasons for it being open and accessible is what happened in 1922. Is the fact that this is what we have. Um, the the other uh, so those are the, the 1901 1911 census returns, the state records of births, marriages, and deaths, um, the BAP church records. Now this is slightly different. Um, these are more Catholic baptisms in Ireland, 
And uh, let's if we click on the map. There's a hundred more baptisms in Swinford Catholic Parish. If you click on that, you get taken to the the um, the uh, listing for Swinford Parish for the records. So you can see they start in 1822, um, and they they they've been transcribed online by the Mayo North Family History Centre. They've been imaged online by the National Library of Ireland, Swinford, and they've been transcribed by Ancestry and Find My Past. Ancestry and Find My Past um, transcribed these public service freely available uh, images that we just looked at there. And here we have all the Moore baptisms 102 baptisms in Swinford, um, Thomas Mo Anna of Thomas Moore and Bridget Moore in 1863. You can look at an image, and this these are the National Library images. Okay, you can zoom in and out. There's a transcription here as well. So this is this is free. It's free to view and find my past. You have to register, um, but you you don't have to subscribe, and um, it's free because. The National Library put made the, the records available for free, and the the um, the two commercial uh, transcription uh, genealogy sites, Find My Past and Ancestry.com, um, made them freely available. Okay, um, let me go back to the 1850s householders by civil parish. This is something I didn't uh, mention. This is again. This is the fourth of the 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 big four. So the 1901, 1911, civil registration records, um, Catholic records, church records, and then Griffith's valuation, this massive property survey. So again, that's freely available on a, a website called um, Ask About Ireland. And um, if you go into this, this again, linked, it's, it's freely available, it's freely linkable too. So we want to see the moors in the parish of Enniskillen there. Um, so we can just click on that. All right. We can click on this. And this shows us all the moors in the parish of Enniskillen. And then there are the original records are there. Um, again, this is only possible because this is done. This is done by the local government rather than the central government. But there you are. You can see all the Enniskillen and it, it, it will tell you um, where on the page the record is and so on. Um, there's another way of going about this as well. If you actually know the townland, say Brain Drum, if you want to see who, who else, who was living in Brain Drum um, in um, Griffiths, in the, in the, this would be in the early 1860s, and you can click on the Brain Drum and you get Brain Drum, the occupants, you get a complete list of the occupants. Um, the County Infirmary and the, the Irish Northwestern Railway were there, Daniel Peterson, and you can go and look at the, the um, okay, there's Brain Drum down there, and you can see who was there, who was occupying the land. It does, only looks as though there's only one um, house, and that's um, Daniel Patterson, who was leasing it from the Earl of Belmore. This looks as though it might have been part of the, the Earl of Belmore's estate. Um, one of the things you can also do from this site, which is um, a great way of wasting an entire evening, is to um, look at the valuation maps. This takes a little um, doing, but um, it's worth it's worth waiting for. Um, the while that's loading, let me just come back here. So you can see, I mean, that the the site is built around those four um, major sources. And the the uh, um, it, it's only possible because of this revolution in access to the records has taken place, and the nature of the revolution, the fact that it was open access. So um, there we have Brian Drum is somewhere down in here, and you have the um, the actual. You can see that the the light lines. You have the the uh, holdings numbered and. You can, um, if you want to have a look at the satellite map and you can use your your little slider up here, go to the, see exactly what's on the land now. 
and this can very easily become compulsive and hypnotic and don't do it while you have an urgent appointment coming up. Um, okay, apart from the, the big four as well, the, the, the revolution has actually shifted out to other record sources too. So for example, um, headstones and uh, headstone transcripts, um, there are lots and lots of volunteer sites um, doing transcripts and link, it's possible to link to them freely and I have them there. Um, another good example is newspapers. Again, the, the main two are the British Newspaper Archive and Irish Newspaper Archives, but, and you can see, there are lots and lots and lots of newspapers online now. Both of those are paying sites, but it's possible to link to the overview of, so for example, the Mid-Ulster Mid Mail, if you click there, you're taken to um, the page on British Newspaper Archive about the Mid-Ulster Mail, tells you exactly what years are covered, and um, it's, it's a subscription site, um, as I say, but at least you know exactly what's there. Okay, um, I hope I've given you a flavour of the kind of um, uh, things that are now possible, the way in which the records relate to each other, the way in which they fit together, um, and the, the, the fact that um, the, that has all changed radically in the last decade. Um, it also explains, I have to say, one of my own um, my own enthusiasm for a lot of what's happened in the last 10 years, having spent the previous 20 years fumbling around with a blindfold on, trying to pill and tail on the donkey, somebody, somebody swipped off the blindfold, turn on blinding spotlights, and I can pill, pin the tail on the donkey um, all day, every day, if I feel like it. So thank you for listening.